learning and hearing in almost every text about demons. About demons. Now, you might be a part of our enlightened society that says, you know what? There's no such thing as demons. That was just pagan weirdos, you know, because, and get this, and, and this is documented, that's just people who believed there were demons and that's why there were demons. Because they didn't know any better. And because they had pagan cultures and lots of gods and things that they worshiped and all, that's why they had demons and Jesus had to constantly cast them out. In fact, he even gave that ability to the disciples to cast out demons. In fact, he even went on to say that he gave all the same authority to the body of Christ to each disciple who follows after Jesus. But in an enlightened society, we all know there's no such thing as those spiritual powers out there, right? I'm warning you, if that's where you're at in an enlightened belief system, you've got another issue. Because if there's no demons and Satan's not real, then there's no Jesus either. Well, maybe there's a Jesus, but he died a long time ago and we don't need to think about him. But frankly, there can't be a God if there's no supernatural forces and powers out there beyond what we can see and think and grab a hold of. And in an enlightened world, an enlightened world tried to say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you got it, finally. You religious people are all screwed up. There is no such thing as a God. Okay, somebody's not praying enough or like Jones said, I had two cups of coffee and I'm in trouble today. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thanks, Les. <laughs> Pray the pastor stays under the Spirit's control and, and that he gets the message to us that God wants us to, to hear, not him. It, it, it's kind of, though, crazy, isn't it? A guy with a thousand demons. In fact... Do you know how many people were actually serving in a legion, in the Roman legion? It's not a thousand. It's 2,000 to 6,000. This is a bunch of demons. Oh, come on. This has got to be evangelistic exaggeration, right? How many people are here this morning? Oh, at least we had four or 500 that, on Sunday, right? That's the way evangelists count, right? <laughs> so that must be this situation here, right? Come on. A legion of demons? A thousand demons? Two to six thousand demons? Well, it's no wonder he could break chains and knock off shackles and no one could control him and he's cutting himself and he's living him among the tombs. It's, it's no wonder what this man's crazy. Whoa, hold on here, hold on here. We're not allowed to say that people are crazy. We're not to say that things might be mental illness. We're not allowed to evaluate and assess people and even decide that, oh my, something might be spiritually going on in their life. Because friends, and here's one of the mistakes that the body of Christ is making. Friends, if we say that somebody's having a spiritual issue, we're judging them, aren't we? Jesus said he wants us to go and make disciples. But who are we supposed to disciple? The people who don't know him. But that does, doesn't that take a spiritual assessment? Doesn't it take conversation? Doesn't take a, a relationship where you get to know people and you find out that people you care about don't believe in Jesus? 
don't know or understand what it means that God loves them so much that he sent his son to die on a cross that whoever will believe in him, they can receive eternal life and that God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world but that through Jesus Christ the world could be saved. Doesn't that take an assessment on your part? Or if everyone's already there, then we don't need to go to anyone. Isn't that correct? But the commission is to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and all people groups. And that as we're doing that, that there's this process then, once they become a disciple, that now you're going to teach them to obey. Now you're gonna baptize them because they've made this commitment to Jesus Christ. And, and you're gonna baptize them and teach them to obey and, you're, and that Holy Spirit, God himself, is gonna be with them all the rest of their life as well as yours. But that took a spiritual assessment on your part, didn't it? But isn't it more judgmental? Think about this. When Jesus talked about judging not lest you be judged, what was he really referring to? He was saying none of us has the right to condemn somebody else to hell. A serious stuff. No one has that right. Well, wait a second. I'll try to quit saying wait a second. Folks, if a person is not on their way to heaven and I choose not to share Jesus with them, do you catch the line of logic? Would it not be more judgmental to not share Jesus with them, to help them grow and become like Jesus Christ, to help them obey the teachings of Christ and the word of God, would it not be more judgmental if I don't do that? Then if I said, I don't think you know God, do you? Or that's really not a healthy action that you're doing. It's harmful to you. In fact, the Bible calls that sin. And, and God said, we're not supposed to sin because it harms us. But the cool thing is, is that God sent a resource to take our sins away from us. And that resource is God himself. Well, look how the man with at least a thousand demons referred to him. Mark, the fourth chapter. What? Sorry about that. Mark 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit. <laughs> this almost sounds um, like an understatement. A man with an evil spirit. Kind of like, okay, he's a guy. <laughs> but wait. <laughs> came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons at his, on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance... He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to me. Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied. For we are many, and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd 
about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. <clears throat> Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Well, it's interesting the way Mark says it, uh, a man with an impure spirit. It sounds like a guy with dandruff in some ways. I mean, you know, when you compare it to, to a, a man with a, a legion, thousands of demons within him, those same demons who will beg and plead, don't torture us. In fact, send us into the pigs and 2,000 pigs will run off the hill and, and draw, jump into the ocean and drown, I should say, the Sea of Galilee rather than the ocean. Uh, but here's a man that by the torment he experienced, he's driven to live in the tombs, places where people are buried. Most people would rather not live in a cemetery. I remember working for Art Good, my friend in college, and he worked at a cemetery, and he had an apartment up over the main mausoleum of this cemetery, and in fact, on the same level was a room next door was where they did all the embalming, and this other room over here was where they kept all the caskets for people to view to see what they wanted to select. And then next to that room was his apartment. When the lights went out in this building, you did not want to be inside. <laughs> because it there were no windows. So when the lights went out, you, could, you literally couldn't see anything in front of you. And I remember the day we pulled the trick. Oh, I shouldn't confess this here. I, I, will, I won't admit that right now. <laughs> Something to do with a casket. But... <laughs> Driven to live among the tombs because he can't handle life with other people because he's violent. And, and look, young people, have you heard about cutting? Some of the rest of you have. Maybe some of you have had that unfortunate problem where the pain inside needs to get out and so you take a razor blade and you start cutting your body. And, and, and many people who have been sexually assaulted and abused have to try to get the demons out in a sense. And they, and they almost feel it's like that. I've got to get the demons out. I've got to get this stuff out of me. And so they'll cut their body. And what does this man do? He says he, he, he doesn't have a razor blade, so what does he use? He uses rocks to cut, to cut his body. And when, they, and when they try to take control of him, they try to overpower him, they can't. They've chained him up and he's able to separate the chains. Well, obviously it was weaker iron back then, so, th so we can understand. It's no big deal, right? <laughs> yeah, you get shackled sometime. And because he was also able to break the shackles that they put around his ankles too. He simply would smash them. I mean, this man, is, uh, he, he, he has so much going on inside of him, the demons, that, that he's able to dis destroy things that are trying to trap him and control him because the demons are controlling him. <clears throat> but do you see the amazing moment here? It's a critical supernatural moment. Jesus is coming and what does the man do? If the demons were controlling him, don't you think the man would do what? run away, take off. And this is critical. 
if the demons had the power to keep this man from Jesus, they would. But they can't. And the man does what? He runs to Jesus. He kneels in front of him. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that what? What does he say? You are the son of the most high God. He knows who he is. How does he know that? Well, the demons have revealed this to him. But instead of running away, he's running to him. He's going to the one person who has the ability to set him free. No one else has been able to do that. Oh, by the way, have you realized where we're at? We're on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. If you go there today, it's the Golan Heights. It's outside of what was referred to as Jewish territory. It's Greek territory. The Decapolis, you'll hear about that at the end of the passage. What's the Decapolis? Ten different cities that rest up here. It's the places where they've got all kinds of gods that they're worshiping. There's a cavern there where they threw people down into the cavern. You asked Leslie about that one. They threw people down into the cavern. If blood came out, oh, that was a good person. If they died, oh, that was a bad person. And the gods just accepted the sacrifice. And this was the place where Peter will declare, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Damascus is one of the cities of the Decapolis. Damascus is located where? As most of these 10 cities are, in Syria. Uh, that ought to be catching your ear because that's in the news even today. And that's the place where this man is from. And why are there a herd of pigs there? You realize they don't serve bacon in Israel, don't you? And why don't they serve bacon? Because they, pigs are dirty. And it's not, I mean, it's worse than not kosher, okay? It's, it's, just, it's dirty. And good Jews don't eat. And so in Israel, you cannot get bacon, bacon. Something not available for you. These pigs are there because these are Gentiles then, aren't they? Gentile herdsmen, Gentile cities. That probably should give you a hint as to why Jesus doesn't allow the man to go with him. But let's move on from here. <clears throat> a man with his impure spirit. What, 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 what else though? Says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? What do you want with me, Jesus? How did he know this man? Because spiritual things have been revealed to him. And he shouts this, in God's name, please, please don't torture me. This man gets it right. Unlike some of our world who thinks there is no God, this man gets it right. Even though he's got this legion of demons controlling and destroying him, he gets it right. Jesus, you're the son of the most high God. You've got power. These demons inside of me don't have. Please don't hurt me. And then the demons, because now he's, got, he's on his knees and he's there in front of Jesus. Now the demons start baking. And why? Because Jesus has made one simple little prayer. He said, come out. Come out. And they're like, oh, please, please, don't destroy us. Don't send us away. We don't want to leave this world at all. Like, please, Jesus, please. And, okay. And he says, who are you? Now, I would pause right here. I don't think that you have to talk to demons to cast them out. Be careful of trying to use this as a teaching method to say, this is what we got to do when we think somebody has a demon. What's your name? And then we go into a long dialogue with him. Jesus is dealing with a legion of demons. And the demons are pleading with him. And so he says, okay, who are you? And they identify themselves. And eventually then he's going to, what? Send them into the pigs. I just hope you catch how powerful it is that the demons, though they are many, cannot keep this man from kneeling in front of Jesus so that anyone who wants to 
can come to Jesus. Remember that when God's calling you to witness to somebody who may be caught in all kinds of things, whatever they're caught in, they're not as powerful and as great as Jesus Christ. So demons, Jesus says, fine. You want in the pigs? <laughs> okay, go for the pigs. And the pigs run down the hill and jump off the, and into the water and they all die. Wonderful. Except there's some guys who've been watching the pigs. And what do they see now? There goes our bank account. <laughs> 2,000 pigs. Now, I'm thinking that these must have been little pigs, probably not the big swine like we've seen, you know, <laughs> the, the really giant ones. Who knows? But, but these, you know, 2,000. That's a lot of money. That's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of money no matter what it's made for. Denarii, dollars, whatever it is, pennies even. That's a lot of money going right down the chute into the water. So news of the pig's demise gets back to the town. The guys who've been watching them, they don't want to be blamed for it. We didn't kill him. We didn't do anything. This guy, you know, the guy that's out there in the tomb, he goes to Jesus. Jesus is standing there. Jesus says, demons, go to the pigs. Pigs run off down the mountain. It's not our fault. Please, please, right? That's kind of probably what they're doing. They get out the back of the town, and the town's like, what do you mean? <laughs> and what if you're one of the ranchers who owns those pigs? Your what, if you're, what do you mean is not very nice, is it? <laughs> and so you're going back out there after them and you want to find out what's, what's actually happened and, and where are they? And, and the people cannot believe it because they get out there and what do they see? They see the fields are empty and there's no pigs. <laughs> but they see the man, and I bet you some of these guys had been a part of this who had chained him up in the past, who had tried to control him in the past and couldn't. And they're there and they say, whoa. In fact, do you remember what happened in Mark 4? They're heading across the Sea of Galilee. A big storm comes up. The water starts going over the boat. Jesus is asleep in the boat. And they wake him up and say, Jesus, we're drowning and you don't care. And he says, just a minute, I can't hear what you said. Silence! Stop! Okay, now that the waves have stopped and the wind has stopped blowing, what do you guys want? I haven't forgotten where I'm at. I'm just like, I'm amazed. And, and then what the scripture says is that the disciples, when they saw this, were terrified. Now, these are the same guys who moments early were, thought they were going to drown and were scared about that. Only now they're more terrified about the fact that, oh, no, look at this. Jesus has control over these things. Storm stops, they come ashore, and guess who's there? <laughs> the man with this unclean spirit. And the people come and see, and what do they find? That the man with the unclean spirit is clean-shaven, dressed, and in his right mind. And they have the experience that the disciples had on the boat. Uh, who are you? Okay, you know what? Please leave. Please leave. Have you ever said that to Jesus? Because our world is. Jesus, please leave. We don't want you here. Please, just, just, just go away. So they hear, they see what's happened. In fact, Alan Carr, speaking of this, he says, if we honor him, he will bless us. If we treat him like we can make it without him, he may just give us what we ask for. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, go away, but are you treating Jesus as if you can do life without him? You don't really need Jesus. I pray that you don't. So Jesus leaves. Whoa. Demons don't bother him, but the guys say, please leave, and so he leaves. 
He's getting ready to get in the boat, and as he's getting into the boat, the man who's just been healed comes running down. And what does the scripture say? Please. He says, the scripture says, he begged Jesus, let me go with you. He's met the man, the son of the most high God, who's made a difference in his life, given him freedom that he's not experienced for who knows how long. He wants to leave the tombs, and he wants to go with the Messiah. Please, Jesus, let me go with you. And what does Jesus say? Uh, no, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back home. I want you to give the good news of what I've done for you to them. It's one of the first missionaries, isn't he? Go back and just tell them the good stuff that God has done for you. Just share your story. And here it is again, isn't it? How does Jesus want us to witness to other people? Go, live among the people, tell your story. Jan and Virgil, 57 years of marriage, celebrate that and let the world know it. That you made it because she's beautiful and because God helped you. <laughs> no, seriously, because God was a part of your marriage for 57 years and then some. Share the story of what it meant to be a faithful husband and wife. Go back and tell your community what marriage means, what family means, and the benefits that that has. Tell the young couples who are represented right here, who are struggling at their marriages. Tell the young people who are thinking it's okay to go do things. It doesn't matter. Sex is okay. Come on. You know, all kinds of sex don't really matter. Tell them what intimacy really means. Go back to your community and tell them what Jesus has done for you. And that's the invitation for all of us is to go back to our communities and tell them what Jesus has done for us. Does evil exist today? Yes. Do demons exist today? Yes. Hmm. There is a theology that says, no, they're not active today, not only because of what I mentioned earlier about the Enlightenment, but the demonic activity was all taken care of when the Bible was complete. And therefore, we don't have to deal with and worry about demons anymore. Is that true? If it's not true, then are you helping people to get set free? Or are you afraid? 1,000, maybe two, maybe 6,000 demons could not keep one messed up person from coming to Jesus. And we're afraid of attacking the demons? When greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Okay, just hang with me for a second. It's time to sound the trumpets. Numbers 10.10 10 says, Also at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and new moon feasts, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. You're supposed to sound the trumpet. A little bit. I'll come back. On the first day of the seventh month, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. It is a day for you to sound the trumpets. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. And I can't, this one I don't do well, sorry. That's the sound of your blast, sorry. God is with us. 
He is our leader. His priests with their trumpets will sound the battle cry against you. People of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your ancestors, for you will not succeed. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them, and it was a calling for Jesus Christ to return. Today is a day to, that we are being called to fall on our knees and pray. And we need to pray for this country. <clears throat> Some might wonder about my reaction to the, to the Supreme Court ruling this week. Some may say, well, Christians are going to overreact. I thought it would be helpful for us to hear what the Supreme Court said about the decision this week. Chief Justice John Roberts, the majority's decision is an act of will, not legal judgment. The court invalidates the marriage laws of more than half the states and orders the transformation of a social institution that has formed the basis of human society for millennia. For the Kalahari Bushmen and the Han Chinese, the Carthaginians and the Aztecs, just who do we think we are? Chief Justice John Roberts. This is in the dissenting statements that he made, so I'm quoting it is striking how much of the majority's reasoning would apply with equal force to the claim of a fundamental right to plural marriage. I was sharing with somebody earlier. Polygamy, you cannot outlaw polygamy to now. You can't. Not on the arguments. We'll listen to Chief Justice. It is striking how much of the majority's reasoning would apply with equal force to the claim of a fundamental right to plural marriage if there is dignity in the bond between two men or two women who seek to marry and in their autonomy to make such profound choices, why would there be any less dignity in the bond between three people who in exercising their autonomy seek to make the profound choice to marry? If a same-sex couple has the constitutional right to marry because their children would otherwise, quotes, suffer the stigma of knowing their families are somehow lesser, end quotes, why wouldn't the same reasoning apply to a family of three or more persons raising children? If not having the opportunity to marry serves to disrespect and subordinate gay and lesbian couples, why wouldn't the same imposition of this disability serve to disrespect and subordinate people who find fulfillment in polyamorous relationships? Chief Justice John Roberts, the court today not only overlooks our country's entire history and tradition, but actively repudiates it, preferring to live only in the heady days of the here and now. I agree with the majority that the nature of injustice is that we may not always see it in our own times. As petitioners put it, times can blind. But to blind yourself to history is both prideful and unwise. People of faith can take no comfort in the treatment they receive from the majority today. The majority graciously suggests that religious believers may continue to, quotes, advocate and teach their views of marriage. The First Amendment guarantees, however, not a ruling by the Supreme Court, but the First Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the freedom to, quote, exercise religion. Ominously, that is not a word the majority uses. Hard questions arise when people of faith exercise religion in ways that may be seen to conflict with the new right to same-sex marriage. When, for example, a religious college provides married student housing only to opposite sex married couples, or a religious adoption agency declines to place children with same-sex married couples. Unfortunately, people of faith can take no comfort in the treatment they receive from the majority today. Chief Justice John Roberts, it is one thing for the majority to conclude that the Constitution protects 
a right to same-sex marriage. It is something else to portray everyone who does not share the majority's, quote, better informed understanding, end quotes, as bigoted. There are 10 of these, I'll just read one more. Justice Alito. The majority facilitates the marginalization of many Americans who have traditional ideas. I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools. By imposing its own views on the entire country, the majority facilitates the marginalization of the many Americans who have traditional ideas. Recalling the harsh treatment of gays and lesbians in the past, some may think that turnabout is fair play. But if that sediment prevails, the nation will experience bitter and lasting wounds, Justice Alito. On the video that was played earlier, it was of congressman who was the main speaker on there, and it's been congressional leaders who have led the way, and I simply want to read from the Call to Prayer for America. And there are a few copies of this. Uh, I believe I left them at the Welcome Center. One of the last paragraphs it says, on the seventh day of March 2015, members of Congress and state legislators from all across America gathered for the purpose of calling the nation back to prayer. They realized the need for America to turn back to God and prayer, not for a single day or a single month, but to pray without ceasing. Accordingly, this day we respectfully and humbly issue this call to prayer for America and invite you to join us in this call by adding your name and further join us by praying for God's continued blessing on this country. <clears throat> call to fall is a call for us to pray to the God who has the power to set people free. It's the God that this young man or knelt down in front of. The legions of demons could not stop him and he pleaded with Jesus, Son of the Most High God, to have mercy on him. We, you see, we, it's easy. It would be easy for us to right now point to the majority of five supreme justices and even pray some kind of bad thing happened to them or whatever. Or, or to pray about, uh, against and say, it's the people out there that, that culturally have no belief in God and they're the problem. Friends, that's not the way the Lord said it at the dedication of the temple where he said that he would be present in the most holy place and that the people could come to him. And he warns them, he says, there's going to be a time when you're going to fall away from me and when you're out there and it stops raining. Well, that's just Southern California. It stops raining and you're facing blight in the land that then if you remember, and then here's what he says next, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, and pray. Then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. Folks, the message that's right there in Second Chronicles is not to the world. Who needs to humble themselves? Who needs to turn from wicked ways? Folks, we've got to admit, we've not promoted and lived out a witness for marriage. How many Christians live together for, for years in intimacy together? How many, how many people, young people, how many young people? It's okay to have sex with whomever, whenever, whatever you want to do. And have said, that's fine. We need to repent because we have evil ways. And if the body of Christ will do what Jesus said to the man, he says, go back. Go back and live and talk to them about what has happened in your life. And that's why I look at two 
of our leaders in the church, and I say, it's your testimony out there that matters. People, God's calling us to get on our knees. And if you're at all capable of doing it, would you please do it now?